Good morning. Whether you are worshiping with us here in person or joining us online, welcome to worship today for the 25th Sunday after Pentecost. It is good to be back with you. I was sorry to miss you all last week, but my family, we were all recovering well, pretty much recovered from our bout with COVID. So thank you all for your prayers and your concern. And thank you to Carl Mintzmoyer, who is joining us on the organ and piano today um, as Allison is on vacation. At this time, let's take a few minutes to prepare our hearts and our minds for worship with the prelude. Please stand for the confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. I invite you to take a few moments of silence for reflection and self-examination. Have mercy on us, O God. We confess that we have sinned against you and against our neighbor. We have built walls instead of tables and have turned away the stranger. We have sought glory for ourselves and have treasured that which does not satisfy. Help us to love as you love, to welcome those you send, and to treasure mercy and justice. Turn us from our ways to your ways, and free us to serve those in need. Amen. God, who makes all things new, forgives your sins for Jesus' sake. 
and remembers them no more. Lift up your heads and your hearts. Yours is the kingdom of God. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, your sovereign purpose brings salvation to birth. Give us faith to be steadfast amid the tumults of this world, trusting that your kingdom comes and your will is done through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
morning. Our first reading is from the 12th chapter of Daniel. At that time, Michael, the great prince, the protector of your people, shall arise. There shall be a time of anguish such as has never occurred since nations first came into existence. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The word of the Lord. We'll speak Psalm 16 responsibly. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all other. <clears throat> my delight. But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. <clears throat> o oh Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. <clears throat> my, soul 
My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Our second reading comes from the 10th chapter of Hebrews. Every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds, he also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one, will, one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign that these, all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. <clears throat> Friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God, Trinity of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. There's something about walking into or beside beautiful grand architecture that causes a feeling of awe in most of us. Think about a time that you entered a hushed cathedral or the dome of a Capitol building, for example. Your head tilts back to find the ceiling, 
your eyes widen a bit, you may turn on the spot. You can't help but marvel at the beauty and the accomplishment of it. Maybe especially if you know it was built before modern technology made such things easier. The sense of completion, permanence, majesty can be pretty impressive. This seems to be what one of Jesus' disciples was feeling as they came out of the Jerusalem temple together in today's gospel reading. This temple, the third to be constructed on the spot, was by all accounts very impressive, with huge blocks of stone and so much gold that you had to shut your eyes in the sunlight to avoid being blinded. Look at this place, the, the amazed disciple breathes. But Jesus is not impressed, apparently. You see all this, he says? It will all come tumbling down, not one stone left on another. And reading this statement in its context, it's likely that Jesus meant to convey a number of different meanings by it. He was warning his disciples about a particular historical moment that would soon occur. The temple would, in fact, be destroyed by the Romans, never to be rebuilt again, in the lifetimes of the people who would have heard Mark's gospel. Jesus also offered this statement as a judgment against the national religious establishment and those who ran the temple worship. Elsewhere, he accuses them of hypocrisy, false worship, defrauding the poor. And so predicting the temple's fall, Jesus was pointing out the hollowness of what it had come to represent. And a comment like this was also tied to the image that Jesus would use of his body being the true temple, the true habitation of God, replacing the Jerusalem temple and its sacrifices. But on another level, Jesus is simply naming a truth that we all experience. In this world, in these times, things fall apart. Things we counted on to always be there. Things we poured ourselves into building. Things we loved and trusted and nurtured. Things that shaped our communities, our days, our identities. Sometimes they fall apart. And that can be sudden. Planes fly into towers and the next day they're rubble. A hurricane hits and the floodwaters rise and a home is destroyed. A car crosses the median and a life is gone. Sometimes the crumbling happens slowly. A relationship grows icy and fractures. A community loses its energy and falls apart. Drugs take over a body and a spirit and wither a life. And the list goes on, right? Traditions and values change, jobs disappear, bodies age, people move on. Things we build, things we love, things we organize our lives around, no matter how rock solid and impressive they seem, they can and do fall apart. And that truth makes us feel unstable and out of control. And we have all kinds of coping mechanisms that we turn to to deal with that insecurity. We numb ourselves in a variety of ways. We put on thick shells and armor to protect ourselves. We frantically pour ourselves into rebuilding. We indulge in bitterness and finger pointing. We manage the heck out of anything that we can control. One thing I know I tend to lean into is information gathering. I was laughing with a friend the other day about the fact that when things feel anxious or important or overwhelming, some part of me believes that if I just know all the things and organize all the information, I'll somehow be more in control. We all have our go-to pathways. Jesus, who could look at the grandeur of the temple and know that it too would fall, invites us instead to have the courage to sit with and acknowledge the fragility and uncertainty 
of all our human constructions, of human life in general, and our ultimate powerlessness. But to acknowledge that not with despair, but with the trust that we have been given what we need to make it through, even when things are crumbling around us. Whenever there's a tragedy, it's common these days to hear someone invoke the advice of the beloved hero of children's television, Mr. Rogers. When I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, Mr. Rogers said to his television neighbors, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. The idea with that is to help kids focus not on the scary events themselves, but on the people who inevitably rise up in such situations to do good for those around them. It's a way of shifting their vision, opening their eyes. In a similar way, Jesus calls us to see the world around us and unfolding events, even distressing ones, differently, to focus in with the eyes of faith. This faith perception is not about somehow peering into God's mysteries to discern the secrets that are held there. That's a temptation for religious folks. We want to crack the code to figure out the timeline and the way that verses from here and there in Scripture, from Revelation and Daniel and Mark and wherever else, can be matched up to events taking place in history. If only you know the secrets. Truly, that is just another way of trying to escape the vulnerability and uncertainty of being human. And Jesus repeatedly points his disciples away from attempts like these, including here in our story today, when he refuses to answer their question about how and when. Instead, what we're given the vision to see is the way that will carry us through the events happening around us as people of faith, the way of salvation, peace, wholeness, shalom, which is available even without full control or understanding. We find clues to this way, this path, and what it looks like, both in our Mark and our Hebrews readings. It's about the way we live and move in our relationships with God, with one another, and with the world. In our relationship with God, the author of Hebrews reminds us that we can live with a bold confidence before God, with a conscience that is set at ease by Jesus' sacrifice for our sake. We don't have to be anxious about our standing with God, putting our trust in the things around us or our accomplishments to feel safe or prove ourselves worthy. We can rest in hope for ourselves for the future, for all creation, simply because God is faithful and trustworthy. Hebrews also guides us in what faithful living looks like in terms of our relationships with one another in the body of Christ. We are called to live in deep and meaningful community with one another. Hebrews urges us to meet together regularly, not neglecting that gathering. We're also, encouraged, we're also to encourage one another and even to provoke each other to live out our faith. Provoke is such an interesting word as it carries somewhat the sense of irritating, needling, of being in each other's space. In the community that Hebrews calls us to, we don't keep our polite distance, but even meddle sometimes for the sake of wrestling together with what it means in this time and this place to engage in acts of love and good deeds so that we can ask together the hard questions about where we are placing our trust and our hope. When it comes to our relationship with the world, Jesus reminds the disciples a few verses after today's reading that their call and ours in the midst of struggle and persecution and uncertainty is to proclaim the gospel, to speak in word and deed 
the good news of what God has done and is doing in Jesus, to give witness to the love of God in Christ. And that means that when things fall apart, when stones come tumbling down, the way through that is seen with the eyes of faith is to go sit with the ones who find themselves in the rubble, to bear witness to the tragedy and pain, to offer what comfort we can, to work for healing, and to point to the God who is already present and is coming again. Our call in a world where things fall apart is acts of love and good deeds in the name of the one who can be trusted to bring us through it. In all of it, we keep our hearts fixed not on the wars and earthquakes and famines and plagues, but on who and what is being revealed through it all. Jesus invites us to trust that in some way, through the pain, the new creation in himself is being brought to birth. The pain is real, but more real still is what will come. We are in a time when we know that things around us are tumbling down. Things we have trusted, things we have worked for, things we have found meaning in. Through the scripture today, God invites us to think about what we are leaning on and leaning into. Things fall apart, but we have been given what we need to make it through an unshakable confidence and hope in God and the gift of each other. Hebrews calls us to worship together, study together, serve together, to be the church together, encouraging in, and even provoking each other to love and good deeds, figuring out together what that looks like in this time and place with the gifts that God has placed in our hands. Our congregation council met this past Thursday, and in a few weeks it will be time to elect a slate of new council members as five current members will be ending their terms. In several months of asking, the nominating committee has not been able to find a single person to say yes to a request to consider running for council. I'm sure that there are a lot of reasons for this, as many reasons as there are people who have thoughtfully said no. But if you were asked, I encourage you to reconsider and maybe even provoking you. If you weren't asked but feel a nudge of the spirit, please let me or another council member know. From a practical perspective, we need 12 members of our council to fulfill the requirements of our constitution. The council is essential to do the business of the church. But it's not even really about just maintaining the institution of Paradise Lutheran Church, keeping the membership rolls full and the lights on for the sake of the congregation. Things fall apart. It's Christ who remains. But friends, we are the church, called by God and given to one another to serve each other and the world, to witness to Jesus, to live the new and living way that has been open to us, as Hebrews says. Together, serving on council is a way of guiding and encouraging this community into love and good deeds, provoking us into proclaiming the gospel. Because when things are falling apart, there is kingdom work for God's people to do. All the more, as Hebrews says, as the times feel urgent. Even as people who know and trust Jesus, it's easy for us to be distracted by the things around us that seem impressive and trustworthy or shiny and desirable, and by the experience of stone walls crumbling, things falling apart and leaving us reeling. Amid all these distractions, Jesus calls us back to him. He is sufficient for this day and every day. And he gives us what we need. 
himself, each other, a role in his mission. Let us hold tight to him and follow him on the way that he is setting before us with courage and joy. Amen. With the whole church, we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Eternal God, you hold firm amid the changes of this world. Hear us now as we pray for the church, the world, and everyone in need. 
God, our creator, you show us the path of life. Bless faithful people everywhere with humility as they extend compassion to those who have experienced harm in religious spaces. Cultivate healthy congregations that tell of and enact reconciling love. We give thanks for those who lead us, for Pastor Seagrid, and for our bishops Elizabeth Eaton and Jim Dunlop. Lord, in your mercy. God, our constant, you love our universe from beginning to end. As the seasons change, protect animals that migrate and hibernate. Bring them safely to a sheltered place and a more abundant season. Lord, in your mercy. God, our ruler, you write your law on human minds and hearts. Give wisdom to all elected leaders and officials to govern with insight and compassion. Make them mindful of the well-being of all people so that your world will flourish. Lord, in your mercy. God, our stronghold, you are present amid disaster. Come to the aid of all survivors of earthquakes, famines, floods, hurricanes, and wildfires, and the first responders who support them. Calm their fear, supply their need, and be the solid ground beneath their feet. We pray for healing to Louise Sambaugh, Coy Sambaugh, Allison Trump, Carl Groover, Caleb Trump, Nancy and Jerry Fry Markle, Chris and Ron Schwartz, Bob Markle, Linda Riley, Penny Nace, Samantha Zorbal, Pamela Hamberger, Morgan Howard, John Reed, Debbie Teal, Haley Seville, Bill Black. We pray for those in prison for Patrick, Cliff, Henry, Keith, and Brandon. Are there others for whom we pray, either out loud or silently? Lord, in your mercy. God, our guide, you are greater than we can imagine. Surround congregations with your expansive inclusion. Be present in the midst of disagreements, differences, and questions. Unite people of diverse viewpoints in the love of Christ. Lord, in your mercy. God, our beginning and our end, your beloved people shine like the brightness of the sky. We thank you for the lives of all who rest in your eternal mercy, from famous saints to the people we have loved. Assure us of your resurrection promise. Lord, in your mercy. God, our hope and strength, we entrust to you all for whom we pray. Remain with us always, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Please stand. The peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you to share a sign of Christ's peace with those near you. God, the earth is yours and everything in it. 
yet you have chosen to dwell among your creatures. Come among us now in these gifts of bread and wine and strengthen us to be your body for the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, surrounded by evil and bordered by death, we appeal to you, our King, our wisdom, and our judge. We praise you for Christ, who proclaimed your reign of peace and promised an end to injustice and harm. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, the sacrifice of his life and death and the victory of his resurrection, we await with all the saints his loving redemption of our suffering world. Send your spirit on these gifts of bread and wine and on all who share in the body and blood of your Son. Teach us your mercy and justice and make all things new in Christ. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is Christ's table, and he is the host of this meal. So come, you who have much faith and you who would like to have more. You who have been here often and you who have not been for a while. You who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed. Come. Christ promises to meet us here. You may be seated.
invite you to stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. to share your gifts until that day when all feast together at your heavenly banquet. Amen. Amen. Just a couple announcements. Today is the last day to sign up for a kit to make an Advent wreath. Those were a lot of fun when we put them together last year, so I encourage you to consider that. And you can sign up online or by talking to Linda Eisenhart. Next week is Christ the King Sunday, which is the last Sunday of our church year, just before Advent begins. And we will have other Advent materials in addition to the wreath kits available next week, including a devotion. Today was the last day of the Making Sense of the Cross um, adult Christian education. So beginning next week, Marty Rexroth will be leading an adult forum class that's based on the four Advent themes of hope, love, um, joy, and peace. It's a video and discussion model, and it will meet in the room in the, hall, the hallway off the sanctuary here for the adult forum. Are there other announcements today? All right. God, the beginning and the end, who has written your name in the book of life, bless and keep you in grace and peace from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. Led on by the saints before us, go in peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>